Kendall, CTO, one of the founders at Trifacta. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about um, kind of inefficiencies we've seen in the analytics process at companies. Um, so things that kind of um, make analytics projects take too long. Uh, and then in, in particular talk about ways we've seen of resolving these inefficiencies so you can get to um, an efficient process. So I think the first thing to note when we kind of look at some of the trends in analytics generally, uh, some of the, the bottlenecks from before are now gone. So if we look at kind of where there have been major advancements uh, on kind of the data platform side, you know, it's already been mentioned today and everyone's well, well aware of this. Technologies like the cloud and Hadoop have made it very cost effective to kind of store as much data as you want, uh, process data quicker than ever before, more cost effectively than ever before, uh, and so on. Uh, we also see that on those platforms you can now store kind of more diverse types of data. Uh, we see a lot of companies taking advantage of that. Uh, so on the one end, we've seen kind of major advancements at where the kind of the, the data lives or where, you know, where it's getting stored. And on the other hand, we've seen major advancements in, in kind of analytic tools. So this could be reporting tools, visualization tools. Uh, Stan mentioned this as well. Machine learning and even statistical tools are becoming kind of commoditized where anyone can kind of, uh, as long as they understand the data they want to work with and kind of they have a, a, a problem they're trying to solve, uh, as long as their data can get into those systems, uh, there's a lot of great technology uh, for doing those types of tasks. So what we've seen kind of emerge as kind of the, the big bottleneck now is, is the space in the middle. How do you take all the diverse data from all the different systems out there uh, and get it into uh, a format those tools can understand, but also ensure that it's high quality so you can ultimately trust uh, your analysis. So this is the space uh, we're in at Trifacta. Um, you know, we, we kind of think this is the new bottleneck in analytics. Uh, broadly speaking now, is, you know, what people refer to as the, the data preparation space. Uh, real quickly, if you're, you're not as familiar with the space, I'll just give you kind of a, a smattering of examples of the types of tasks uh, people are doing with, with data prep, um, ranging from kind of small data volumes to, to large data volumes um, and everything in between. So, uh, you know, it could be still today, a lot of people are working with spreadsheets. Oftentimes, data organized in spreadsheets is not really kind of optimized for a relational system or kind of the format an analytic tool would expect. So you kind of have to transform this into something that looks more relational. Um, similarly, you know, now, uh, and we saw this actually in the last talk, uh, you know, things that look like kind of semi-structured data like uh, log files that oftentimes also need to get moved into relational formats. Uh, or you might have uh, kind, of, kind of standard flat log files like this. Uh, potentially even heterogeneous log files that are kind of spitting out uh, records in different formats in the, in the same data set. Um, even within relational systems, oftentimes uh, you might have you know, things like names, addresses, phone numbers that are just formatted in different ways and they need to be you know, standardized into a, a single format. Um, your data might be kind of nice and, and relational in, in kind of rows and columns. Uh, so here we kind of see crime rate by state and year. Uh, but for whatever reason, your, your application might like the data organized in this way. So there's, there's a process you need to do to transform that. Uh, similarly, you might combine data sets. So you have simple cases like lookup tables, you know, mapping from some code to a name. Uh, you might have kind of harder cases. Uh, so you might be looking at data at one granularity and trying to map it to data at another granularity. Uh, and kind of on the data quality side, things like resolving missing values, outliers or extreme values. Uh, and maybe potential duplicates that you want to resolve in a, in a data set. So if we kind of look at that bottleneck, I think what's happened as kind of the other ends of the spectrum have gotten easier to deal with, this middle piece has kind of started to take up more and more of the time. Uh, so this is a quote from uh, DJ Patel, a uh, chief data scientist. I uh, said, it's, it's impossible to overstress this. 80% of the work in any data project is in cleaning the data. Uh, so I talked a little bit about kind of what types of tasks go into cleaning and preparing data. Uh, but what we've kind of been looking at over the last few years with Trifacta is, you know, why does this take so long? What are kind of the, the main inefficiencies in the process of cleaning the data itself uh, that make this such a challenge? Uh, and what we've kind of come up with is that within this process, there's a lot of kind of iteration that happens, uh, things we might call loops in the process. Uh, and we found three ways in which uh, those loops become highly inefficient. So I'm just going to start going through those one by one and different ways we've seen to kind of tackle each of them. So the first one uh, we call kind of dependency loops. The idea here is that, you know, across a company, you have, you know, more and more people who kind of crave data to get their job done. Uh, they might need data to get their job done. 
Uh, but kind of unfortunately, what we've seen is when it comes to kind of data preparation and cleaning the data, uh, in a typical organization, there's usually only kind of a small subset of people who have the skills necessary to prepare data. Uh, so naturally, you get a, a dependency where others in the organization become dependent on one of their coworkers. Uh, so typically, you know, up, up in the right there, we might have a, a data analyst or a business analyst, uh, and they're going to ask their coworker for work. So kind of going along that top loop. Uh, and the coworker, kind of, you know, typically at their leisure, will respond with uh, some results. Uh, and those results might be exactly what the analyst needed. It might be a little bit off. Uh, and you get in kind of this loop where someone has requirements in mind because they understand kind of the business context. And then there's someone else in the organization who kind of has the skills necessary to provision the data. Um, and, uh, you know, we would say this is highly inefficient for a number of reasons, but, uh, you know, it has kind of all the problems you'd have when you rely on someone else for anything. Uh, you know, misaligned priorities, they have a hundred other things they're trying to do. Um, there's a lot of communication overhead you're trying to describe. Uh, oftentimes a very complex process and complex set of requirements to someone. Uh, so you get in this long iterative loop where each iteration can take, you know, in the best case minutes, uh, but oftentimes hours, days, weeks, uh, up, up into months, um, or maybe you never get the data at all. Uh, so, you know, why is this? And the thing we've seen at a lot of companies is kind of the existing tool chain for preparing data uh, just requires a level of expertise that many of the people who want data just simply don't have. Uh, so probably still today, the most common is using kind of hand coding tools. Um, so programming languages, Python, Spark, uh, SAS, and so on. Um, and then in other cases, you have uh, kind of more workflow mapping or ETL tools, which at the end of the day still kind of require you to kind of explicitly write uh, code um, that will then, then run. Um, so instead, uh, the approach we've seen with kind of data preparation tools uh, is the idea that instead of kind of interacting at the code level to work with data, uh, you have users interact at the data level. And as they interact with data, the idea is that the system should kind of iteratively learn and predict or suggest uh, transformations they want to apply to their data. So here's kind of a very simple example. You're just trying to extract, uh, looks like, I think, milliseconds from a date time here. Um, as you kind of highlight uh, one value, the system takes a guess, uh, gives you kind of a quick preview, looks like this one's wrong. As you give it more examples, it kind of updates. So the idea here is that uh, by kind of using this kind of iterative suggestion model, uh, you can reduce that cycle time. Uh, so we go from kind of this long running uh, dependency loop into a loop that's more of self-service. So the idea is you still have an analyst, uh, but instead of kind of asking a coworker to do something for them, they ask kind of a software product. Um, and in the same way that you know, your coworker might get it slightly wrong, the algorithm oftentimes will also get it wrong. And you get in this feedback loop where you're continuously kind of giving more examples, training the system, giving it more feedback until eventually you, you get what you want. Um, but now the idea is the loop, instead of you know, lasting kind of days or weeks, can be done in milliseconds to seconds. So you get this much tighter cycle um, where analysts can actually prepare data themselves. And kind of the net effect is you go from the small set of uh, people preparing data uh, to now hopefully, you know, a much larger set of people across the organization. So second loop um, is what we kind of refer to as uh, the batch loop. Uh, and the idea here is that if you look at, again, kind of existing ways of doing this, oftentimes you start off by kind of writing, uh, writing a script, typically kind of a whole transformation script at a time. Um, you then run that entire script over all your data. Uh, so you might see this a lot, you know, you ask someone what they're doing, oh, I'm compiling my code, or you know, now it's, you know, I'm, I'm running my code. Uh, so you kind of sit back and relax, wait a while for that to run, and then only after you've kind of run this very complicated logic over a lot of data, do you actually even see any data. And then you begin validating the data, um, you look for errors across kind of the entire data set, and then you try to correlate that back to what happened across my entire script. Uh, so, again, we got to have this long running loop where you start with kind of all of your logic. You run it over all of your data, so it might you know, take a potentially long time. You finally get some results, and then you are going to go back and find and fix your errors. So what's kind of wrong with this cycle? I'm sure everyone's, or most people have probably seen things like this before, almost across kind of any project plan. Uh, graphs like this, you know, very common when they kind of talk about agile development or test-driven development. Basic concept is, you know, the longer you wait to kind of validate your work and make sure you're going on the right track or test out your results, uh, kind of the higher cost of change you get. 
so when we think about kind of this batch loop, you're basically writing out all your logic, you're running it over all of your data, and then you're finally validating all of your results. We would say that has a you know, very high cost of change. And again, if you, you know, kind of think about why this is, I think a lot of it still goes back to the tooling, where if you look at you know, the most common tools, probably you know, the thing that stands out most once you think about it is you don't see any data at all, right? So it's essentially impossible to validate anything. Um, so that kind of leads to, to one level of batchiness where you're just working at kind of the logical level and, and never really stopping to look at the data itself. Uh, and the second I'd say is with tools like this kind of encourage a workflow of running this over all of your data. Um, and, and that leads to kind of batch, batchy long cycles waiting, waiting for your jobs to actually run. Uh, so similarly, just looking at kind of uh, data preparation tools today, the idea is again to kind of keep you uh, looking at your data. So as you're defining transformations, you're not only kind of you know, uh, seeing uh, the code potentially, but also getting kind of immediate visual feedback in terms of kind of example values here, or at the top, you know, common to see things like summaries of your data, uh, data quality bars, so like the green and red bar up there indicating maybe some valid values, potentially invalid values, but you're kind of continuously getting feedback at the time you're defining your transformations. Uh, so jumping ahead here again, idea is to take this kind of batchy loop and instead of working kind of on entire scripts over uh, kind of long running jobs, uh, Basic premise is you replace kind of validation over the entire script with validation at each step along the way. Uh, so you still, you know, you're going to craft the transformation, but you're going to run it interactively. Um, you'll get some results, potentially some extra validation as well, and you'll still have to see and fix errors. You know, we're not we're not taking that part of the process away, uh, but it happens immediately. Uh, and the savings you get comes again from this graph, where the idea is if you push up that kind of part of the debugging cycle earlier into the graph. Uh, you can get a much lower cost of change. All right, so jumping into the, the, the third loop, uh, what we call kind of disconnected loops. So kind of the idea of the first two is to speed up individuals within the organization. You know, the first one is about uh, making an individual kind of, um, you know, providing them with self-service so they're not waiting on someone else. Uh, the second one is taking kind of this batch process and shortening it, but it's still about this individual um, so in the third one, we want to look at how do we kind of scale out efficiency across a group of individuals uh, who are all working on data. Uh, so again, uh, going back to the kind of you know, the group of individuals, ideally they're all uh, being effective and preparing data, analyzing data, building models, building reports, and so on. Uh, what we've seen though is what kind of happens over time is that uh, you form kind of these silos within an organization. Sometimes kind of at the individual level, um, oftentimes it'll be kind of smaller teams of people who work together, uh, and there's very little kind of communication across these teams, very little sharing or collaboration across these teams, uh, maybe some slight overlap. Uh, and the challenge is you get what we call kind of a, a, a disconnected loop. Uh, so if we think about the preparation process in the top right there where you're, you're preparing data, um, ultimately as you're preparing data, you're producing all of this very useful metadata all of the transformations you build, all of the validation you do could potentially be shared, especially within an organization where um, I think it's a pretty good hypothesis that other people in your organization are interested in similar types of data, doing similar types of analysis. Um, so once you've generated all this metadata, uh, ideally at some point you'll be able to kind of curate it and others can take advantage of it. Uh, but what we've seen in, in most systems is that kind of the onus of capturing the metadata that would be useful for others is placed back on the individual. So there's kind of this manual process of capturing the metadata so that it can be shared with others. Uh, and then kind of conversely, once you have all of this you know, great curated metadata, it's kind of your job to be aware of it, uh, to make use of it. Uh, so you're both manually kind of sharing the metadata and using the metadata generated by others. Uh, and you know, when you think about this at the individual level, you know, there's one person uh, you know, who hopefully their loop is going quickly, but as kind of the team grows, you get more and more of these loops and more and more of this kind of redundant type of work that happens within an organization if people aren't aware of what's available to them. Uh, so just to kind of you know, paint some of the pictures that, that kind of go wrong here and why it leads to inefficiency, uh, you get stuff like a, a lot of repetition. So I'm doing something that someone else has already done 10 times. Uh, you're producing lots of duplicated data or near duplicates across the organization. Uh, and then this also leads to a lot of kind of inconsistencies in the way people define business concepts. Uh, so here's a very simple script, uh, just to kind of give that as an example. 
And these first few lines uh, are just kind of splitting up a raw, say, CSV file into rows and columns. Uh, then maybe you're splitting out the email into username and domain. Uh, in this first use case, I'll delete all the users from Trifacta because they're going to bias my analysis potentially. Uh, then I'm creating a couple of metrics and aggregating that data. Uh, on the right, we have a, a fairly similar analysis. Uh, the first thing you'll notice, you know, these top three lines are exactly identical, as you might expect for parsing kind of a CSV file. So ideally something that only one person would have to define or is automatically inferred. Um, we keep going down, we start seeing where some of the inconsistencies come in. The first user calls it username, the second one calls it user. Uh, in this case, the second user on the right decided to delete people with test.com and trifacta.com and so on. You can start seeing these subtle differences in metrics that lead to kind of uh, you know, miscommunication, uh, hard to trust kind of assumptions uh, in, in the end results, and a lot of just inconsistencies, um, as well as inefficiency in the process. Uh, so you know, what, what are the mechanisms people typically use today to kind of solve this? Uh, I'd say generally if you look at kind of software development process, there's been uh, a lot more in terms of development there and aiding kind of collaboration across uh, users and teams. So I think generally speaking with analytics, there's, there's still a long way to go. Uh, I'd say kind of here going back to kind of explicit sharing is probably the one thing most tools uh, offer today. Um, and you know, this is kind of, you, you have to have a feature like this, right? You have to be able to share with your coworkers. Uh, so definitely in, incredibly important. Uh, but again, the onus is kind of on you to understand at what granularity should you share something uh, who needs the thing that uh, you, uh, or who might make use of what you've already done, and kind of vice versa. You need to kind of reach out to people and say, hey, I, I'd like to get this product, or this might help me with my analysis. Uh, and I think the reality is today, uh, there's just so much going on with data that it's really hard to track all the available artifacts in the system. Uh, so I think, and actually Stan kind of teed this up nicely for me, uh, well, one of the technologies that's coming out today that really, I think, uh, starting to help with this, both kind of in the commercial and open source size, are uh, things for capturing metadata, uh, you know, catalogs, systems for enabling curation. Uh, and I think uh, one of the nice things here is the ability to kind of automatically capture tons of metadata, whether it's kind of physical metadata or lineage operating on data, or kind of more business metadata, concepts, um, other attributes that uh, people might be interested in. Uh, and similarly, I think on the preparation side, the idea is to use a similar method of providing suggestions, uh, but, in, but in this case, not just looking at kind of the data or a single user, uh, but providing suggestions based on what other users in the organization have done. And most importantly, I think going forward, uh, what we really need to see is integration between the tools that people are using for analytics, uh, and oftentimes it's going to be uh, much more than one tool, uh, and these cataloging systems for capturing metadata. Uh, and I think, you know, going back again to, you know, the inefficient loop, I think one way to kind of really speed up this loop and, and make it much more efficient is instead of kind of relying on others to kind of manually capture metadata and manually leverage it, uh, having systems that automatically capture it and automatically leverage that metadata uh, to provide predictions and uh, uh, kind of facilitate collaboration across an organization. And hopefully you go from you know, more of a kind of siloed network to something that looks like a more highly networked network or highly attached network. So with that, uh, those are kind of the, the three loops of inefficiency. Uh, and the idea here is to kind of you know, re replace them with efficient loops, uh, moving to a system that's based more on kind of self-service, interactivity, and kind of a, a highly networked organization. And with that, I'd like to stop and take any questions. Just one question from me. So the, the vision is that uh, all data prep should be handled by data analysts uh, in, the, in the future, or will data scientists always have a role? Yeah, uh, so, yeah so I think uh, our vision is that anyone who needs to use data, I guess in, in the same way Stan said, no one should have an excuse for not getting their data. We feel like uh, the tooling should evolve so that anyone who, who needs data and has it is able to get it into a format ensure that it's high quality for their analysis. Um, ultimately, because uh, we think it's the most efficient, the person who has the task at hand uh, understands what they're trying to do the best. Uh, the overhead of communicating that to someone else, especially as kind of these tasks get more complicated, um, it just becomes too costly. 
Uh, so we believe that yeah, if you want to get something done, you should, should be able to do it yourself. But there is a type of data prep that all data prep will be handleable by data analysts, meaning non-deep you know, technical data scientists, or is there a, a type of data prep that will always be the province of you know, very advanced uh, people? Uh, well, I think when, you're, uh, when your data prep starts involving potentially um, kind of moving systems from kind of more exploratory uh, use cases, and then when you kind of decided that something is of high value and you move that into production, uh, sometimes we do see in those cases that uh, you're kind of transferring that work onto uh, kind of a core engineering team that's responsible for building out production pipelines that you know, will have 100% reliability, um, will scale out, run efficiently, uh, and, and do some of that as well. Um, so I think in some cases we do see kind of those work, workflows move from exploratory. When they move from exploratory workloads more into production, that there's sometimes a handoff of that logic. Uh, but even in those cases, ideally you'd kind of have a system uh, that makes that easy. We've seen some use cases where someone's building out all their logic in, in a, you know, a programming language um, for production, uh, which means if you're you know, operating in some other tool, um, potentially you have to translate all of that logic into a new system, which also comes with its own kind of overhead. And Great. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, I actually have two questions. The first one, I think, y um, Matt, right, you kind of already asked for me, but I, I wasn't clear. Um, so the first one is, isn't a data engineers, the people who, um, you know, in charge of all those that um, you just described that your software can do? So do you think that your software is going to replace data engineers in the future? And, and what's the second so that you can answer both? Oh, okay. So the second one is, I feel like isn't um, um, missing data the biggest problem when you deal with um, you know data preparation? And I don't think I've seen um, any mentions on your presentation regarding on that topic. So can you also like elaborate on that? Sure. Uh, so I think t to your first question, uh, uh, with data. I uh, believe what was the question is this going to replace data engineers? Uh, so what we've seen, um, again, I think kind of with the vision is that the people who have something they want to get done should be able to, to do it themselves. Um, oftentimes what we've seen, especially with some of these platforms, is that data engineers can play a, a huge role in empowering those users by, um, by providing more functionality into these platforms. So a lot of the platforms for doing data preparation, for instance, are extensible. So if you have... Uh, specific custom functions that are kind of unique to your organization, or if you're doing something, you know, as Matt mentioned before, maybe uh, highly complicated that maybe requires sophisticated modeling um, or some other statistical technique to clean the data, um, they can kind of uh, build out those algorithms and plug them into the platform so that they're available to um, uh, more people across the organization. And the goal there being that uh, instead of data engineers kind of doing one-off tasks for individuals, they can instead spend their time on kind of higher leverage actions that everyone across the organization can use. I think the other aspect, which I started kind of mentioning before, Matt as well, is when the process moves from something that's uh, still kind of in value, evaluation or kind of exploratory prep, where you're building a model to test it and see if it actually works and will provide value, uh, when you start moving those use cases that are, you know, that look really promising into production, oftentimes there there's a hardening of the data preparation kind of pipeline itself. And oftentimes we see, still see that kind of you know, highly trained data engineers are responsible for that hardening to make sure the process scales. Um, One quick word on, on missing data and then uh, sure. another question and then I wanna, we're running a little tight on time. So yeah, I, I didn't touch too much on the specifics of different aspects of kind of data quality or data prep. I think I mentioned missing data very quickly, just an, an example uh, there, but I, I'd say absolutely missing data is a huge problem, uh, and uh, I think there's a couple ways you know software can help deal with it. One is just kind of identifying where there's missing values. Uh, sometimes that's very easy if it's just kind of a null cell in a, in a column or something like that. Uh, but if there's kind of entire chunks of records missing or a single record missing, uh, being able to kind of automatically know that there's literally just an entire record absent uh, can be difficult without. Um, uh, without kind of explicit rules. So there we've seen uh, a lot of techniques looking at kind of 
uh, you know, big gaps or fall offs in the amount of data um, over time. So looking at kind of how data changes over time and understanding that um, you know, you're expecting 100 records every day or you've gotten 100 records for the last week and you know, on, on day number six, uh, there's only 50 records. So you know, what happens? So those types of uh, kind of anomaly detection techniques can be, I think, applied to identify uh, missing records. And then in terms of you know, what do you do once you have missing records, uh, you know, there's probably a thousand different things people do. Sometimes you know, they delete all the records. Sometimes they replace it with some default or sentinel value. Uh, so the whole premise of our software generally, Just very quickly, very quickly, yeah, sorry, uh, is that going back to the loops, we don't feel that the um, you know, algorithms or predictions that we provide are ever going to be 100% correct or any algorithm will be. Uh, we think there's a level of domain expertise and knowledge that needs to be kind of transferred in, into the algorithm and, and trained. So uh, in terms of what you can do for transformation, we'll often provide uh, different suggestions, but ultimately, you know, whatever you can do with a transformation language you can do. So um, you could build a model that uses um, you know, some other column to predict something that fills in the value. You could replace them with zero. You could delete them, um, anything you, you'd like. And I think the goal of the system is that over time, it kind of learns the preferences of the users and uh, the organization at large um, to, provide, to fine tune those suggestions. Great. Last question over there. Let's keep it reasonably quick. Yeah, so uh, my name is Holmer Gislason. I'm VP of data at Click. So, uh, partner of Trifecta, actually. So uh, I'm going to pick up on, on kind of Calibra uh, as well. So, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, business, so I'm going to pick up on your kind of interoperability point there. I think that, so first of all, business analysts and data scientists are very different beasts. Uh, business analysts typically have analysis in mind they want to do. So they first want to go and see if the data exists because the best data preparation is data preparation done by someone else. And then if it doesn't exist, they want to prepare it. And this kind of you know goes to you have you you start the process in an analytics tool. You more have, may have to go out into a data catalog and do you know searching there, uh, bring in data, or you may have to do data preparation on your own. But today these are very much islands, and you know it's it's just as much our fault as it is anybody else's. But how can we kind of stop breaking down these barriers between the tools? Uh, sure. So I think the main thing that you mentioned kind of is kind of interoperability. And I think one of the things that I've seen with a lot of, lot of tools, um, ultimately, because you're right, an analyst and a data scientist are often going to have multiple tools they're going to use. They're going to use the best tool to get whatever aspect of their job, uh, uh, whatever, whatever's best for the, you know, that aspect of the job. Uh, so I think the important piece is not really locking in your internal metadata. Otherwise, it becomes incredibly hard to interoperate. Uh, so that's both kind of you know, being able to read in and providing APIs. Uh, to kind of read in other data, uh, but also providing APIs so that others can access that data. Um, I think, generally speaking, that kind of metadata is the main thing at the heart of a lot of this that kind of is going to drive a lot of this interoperability. Uh, so having tools that can uh, kind of openly exchange uh, metadata, allow them to kind of retrieve objects, create objects, uh, and so on. And it seems like a very kind of simple concept, right, just providing APIs. Uh, but I think over time, as you see kind of how these workflows evolve, and having the right APIs, whether it's kind of embedding, um, you know, for instance, in our tool, we've started embedding catalogs in our in our product so that when you're searching for data, you can just automatically search over the catalog because they'll provide better search than, than we provide. Uh, when we go to publish our data, being able to publish directly into something like Click um, so that you get kind of that immediacy, uh, you're not kind of broken out of your workflow, um, I think is incredibly important. Great. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you.